that, uh, okay, we can go with it, didn't realize that Christ, the Son of God, God himself would live in a human being. Now, they had the Holy Spirit that came upon, and temporarily the Holy Spirit might have dwelled within some of the prophets, the people, uh, people that God had chosen for a while to do specific jobs. But every believer today has God Almighty living in him or her by the Spirit of God. And that was hidden back then. Now, I want you to look at the Scripture on the board. The mystery of which was hidden. A lot of things were hidden. But through the, uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, many of the things that were hidden has been revealed, and he has written it down. And he writes this down. He says, the mystery. Well, what is the mystery? Say, we have to ask ourselves questions of which was hidden for ages and generations from angels and men. Boy, that's powerful now. Powerful. Everybody see that? All right. But is now, right now, and of course in Paul's time, revealed to his holy people, the saints. Now, can you, can, you, can you suck that in? There's some type of mystery. What is that mystery? Well, let's look at the next verse. <clears throat> verse 27. To whom God was pleased, to whom, that's the people of God, God was pleased to make known how great for the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. So this mystery has a, a glory uh, and it pleased God to make it known to us. And what is it? Anybody can tell me? It's right up there. Which is what? Christ within us and among you. The hope of realizing the glory or realizing this is how we're going to attain heaven. Christ in us is our only hope. Put the uh, King James up there on Colossians 1.27 now. Most of them might be more familiar with that. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery what, among the Gentiles. Now, we're the Gentiles. And he's made known to us this mystery. And what, well, what is it now? It's up here. Somebody tell me. Which is Christ in you, in you. That's the mystery. See, they didn't have that back in the Old Testament. The angels didn't know that. See how blessed we are today? Christ in us is our only hope of glory or our only hope of heaven. Wow. That's awesome. And that was hidden from the angels and from all the Old Testament Christians. They didn't, uh, people of God, they didn't know that. And now this mystery has been known to us Gentiles that Christ lives within us. Everywhere we go, the Lord Jesus is with us. Now, the resurrected Lord is in heaven, but his spirit lives within us. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ, who is God. So remember, the Holy Spirit is Christ living in us by his spirit. Now, the resurrected Lord, who is a man, where is he seated? At the right-hand side of the Father. All this is Scripture. Now, you know your Scripture. You can follow me in your mind because you know the Word of God. You've been studying it for years. So you know that. Now, wow, what a powerful thought. So, <clears throat> the God that had the Ten Commandments written on stone now it has been written in our hearts. Isn't that powerful? The Ten Commandments is written in our hearts. And that's found in Hebrews 10. Now, of course, you all know that. But uh, in fact, let's turn there just in case you might not know it. Might be 8, just say 10. Let's start with verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 16, okay? What a 
salvation we have. God himself is now living in his creatures. In every child of God, he lives within every child of God by his Holy Spirit. And <clears throat> people struggle and say, well, you know, it's so hard to keep the Ten Commandments. Well, you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. You get to. <laughs> because the one that wrote the Ten Commandments lives in you. Hello? Okay? All right? And he will direct you and guide you and lead you into all truth. See, we have to see the, the, the mystery, which is God himself living in human beings today, in you and in me. And everywhere we go, we carry him, okay? Now, let's read this at verse 16. This is the agreement, testament, covenant. See, now remember, we are under a new covenant, okay? that I will set up and, and conclude with them after those days, says the Lord. I will imprint my laws upon their hearts. So where is the laws of God now? In, imprinted in our hearts. My laws upon their hearts, and I will inscribe them on their minds, on their innermost thoughts and understanding. Let's go to the next verse. See, this better covenant with better promises, okay? He then goes on to say, and their sins and their law-breaking, I will remember no more. Hallelujah. Give God, give him, go ahead and give him a good shake. All right, every one of us owes this person a million dollars, okay? Can you, can you grasp that? He come, and he comes to you and say, cancel, you don't owe me nothing, you're free. How many would shout on that? How many, how many would do a little jig? Huh? Uh, see, it's bigger than that. So God is not holding anything against us. See, you, you've got to let that sink into your brain, into your spirit, because the enemy will deceive you. And try to make you think God ain't for you. Now, wait a minute. God is in you. He has invested himself to live in us. All right? Now, let's move on with this. Go to the next verse. Now, he don't remember our law breaking and our iniquities. And I said, now we're, where there is absolute remission or forgiveness and cancellation of the penalty of, the, of these. Now, stop there for a moment. Not only is our sins forgiving, but the penalty of sin is gone. All right? And, and, and the penalty of these sins and law-breaking, they're gone. There is no longer any offering made to atone for sin. Now, what does it mean? It's our, you don't need no other sacrifice or any other offering. See, he was talking to the Hebrew Jewish people when he was saying that. And of course, they had to have an offering for every sin that they committed. You, will you understand that? They don't need no more offering now. One offering took care of all the sins of the world. The one offering, Jesus Christ. Wow. So we don't need no more offerings and no more uh, lambs or any other offerings made to atone for sin because Jesus atoned for him once and for all. All right? Anybody following me? I don't want to lose you. I'm going somewhere. Verse 18. Uh, what? That's for, okay. We've already said that. Let's go to the 19. That's okay. Therefore, brothers, since we have full freedom and confidence to enter into the Holy of Holies by the power and virtue of the blood of Jesus. Now, what is he talking about? Well, we just learned that we don't have any sins on us anymore. God don't remember our sins anymore. The one offering took care of all the sins once and for all. And so there's no more any offering.
to be offered for sin because Jesus is the one offering that took care of all the sins past, present, and future. Now, what sin do you have on you tonight? None. Now, but just suppose you, you, you did something naughty. Maybe you said something you shouldn't have said or you... I mean, what, what kind of sins do Christians do today? I don't know. I've been, I've been, I don't do those anymore. <laughs> throw bricks at your neighbor, or throw bricks at your neighbor, or throw your garbage over at his yard. Or <laughs> All right, now, catch this thing now. How can you come with such freedom and confidence to enter into the Holy of Holies. Now, you've got to go back and understand in the Old Testament, they, they wouldn't get near the Holy of Holies. Only the high priests could go into the Holy of Holies once a year. And he had to go in there first to put blood on the altar, the mercy seat, for himself first, make sure he's clear, then he took blood in there for the people. But our high priest took care of it all. And 24-7, we can go to the Holy of Holies, listen, with freedom, with confidence to enter. How many has ever been scared to go into somebody's house because they you didn't know if they really liked you? Hmm? You remember the old saying, the old guy would come home, he'd stay out a little late, and he'd come home, and he'd open the door and throw his hat in there. You know, and if his wife threw it back out, he knew he wasn't going to go back in because he didn't have no confidence and no freedom because she was hot, and, she, and, and, he, and he was going to feel the wrath. We don't have to fear that. Christ took care of it all. The penalty, the sin, the law breaking, everything. We are absolutely free to enter into the Holy of Holies and fellowship with God. I try to get people to see, you know, that's wonderful and, and, and that's fine. But see, God wants our fellowship. See, I want you to see that two ways. Oh, yeah, we can go in and we can and, and, and fellowship with, with God and talk to him and receive grace and mercy when we need it. But look at his side of it. Let me put it down where we can understand it. Some of you might not, but how many really likes their kids to come home sometimes? Huh? That maybe call you on the phone. Hey, Mom. Hey, Dad. Well, I, I haven't heard from you in thir three, four months. Why are you calling now? Of course, you don't do that. You say, come on home. Mama's got some cornbread cooking for you. And that, remember that stew you used to like? Oh, oh, we got two pots of it. Come on home. Come on home. You are welcome. Always remember, are you listening to me now? You're always welcome to go to the throne of God, your Heavenly Father. He is your Heavenly Father. He will do you no harm. You can always go without fear, with freedom. You know why? Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. They did not have that in the Old Testament. Yeah, God talked to them through prophets. He talked to them many times, uh, some folks with, with an angel of the Lord. But he talks to us personally. We were talking about, we've heard, the, and we quote that scripture that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And Susan and me see this, and Frank, he gets so excited. I mean, what a testimony he has about going all the way to Texas. He's looking for the lawyer for his son. I mean, the lawyer is the lawyer for his son, but he didn't know exactly where he could find him. And he gets on the elevator. And the door shuts. Guess who's on the elevator? 
a lawyer. <laughs> is, I mean, somebody's got to shout on that or do something, you know, scratch your head or something. That's odd. But I see that so many times. You remember, I, I told you about the snake that God spoke to me, go across the lawn, look for the snake, and my, my uh, golf cart came right up to where the snake was, and I killed him. Well, there was another snake under our house uh, about a month ago, and I saw him go up under there. And uh, somehow Susan just, uh, we won't go into that, okay. I didn't want her to go up under the house and kill it. So anyway, I said, let's touch and agree. <laughs> Nelma, you doing okay back there? <laughs> You're trying to figure me out, aren't you? <laughs> I said, honey, let's touch and agree that God will lead me to the snake and I'll be able to kill him and you don't have to worry about it, okay. So I got, because so, I got so tired of, you know, every time we pulled up in the driveway, me to pick Susan on my shoulder and carry her in the house where she was scared to walk, you know, because of the snake. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm seeing some of the expression on their face. Take the camera this way. We need to get a camera this way. <laughs> just kidding. But we touch a degree. Now, I come up. That snake ain't on my mind. Three days ago, I come up in the yard, the driveway, and guess what's laying out there sunning in, on my front lawn? The snake. I pull right up with my golf cart, and I kill the snake. All right? And I didn't throw him over in Mrs. James's yard. I threw him over there in Elizabeth's yard. No, I got a pot, of, a little piece of woods back there. I, I got rid of the snake, you know. But see, that's, that's God. Uh, yesterday, I had to, Susan asked me to go out to buy a little, I'm sorry, but get some ice cream. Because <sighs> I had a special on three quarts for $10, so I got three quarts, two, oh, gallons, I'm sorry, gallons. Y'all pray for me, Emma. Okay. So I go out there, and I get out of my car, and I start walking in the bylaw. Guess what? I left my wallet home. Now, here's the timing of God. So I get back in the car, and I could drive all the way to the house, and I come up in my driveway, and there's a man that just got finished knocking on the door. Susan was in there praising God, you know, and she didn't hear him. And so... He walks in the front yard, and I pull up, and I introduce myself to him. He introduced me. We started talking about the Lord and everything. He, he was somebody that used to go to church, but he got hurt and didn't go no more. So, I, 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 man, I said, listen, God loves you. God wants fellowship with you. He's, see, I come from God's viewpoint. Are you listening? Come from God's viewpoint sometimes. God, God misses you. When you don't come to church with his, with his other children, he misses you when you're not there. He, he never heard nothing like that, have you? Huh? Have you ever? Are you listening? Are you out there? See, we need to come in from God's viewpoint. God just, he misses you when you're not in church. I didn't tell him I miss him. But I gave him one of uh, uh, Naomi's singing tapes. I said, listen, you listen to this and, and you'll hear God. And I gave him some other literature, and we prayed, and man, he, he, he was feeling the presence of God. I mean, God was reviving him right there. And I gave him one of our cards. Make sure you take some of those cards back there uh, on our, you know, on our uh, website and get them, get them hooked up to our preaching there by giving them one of those. They can hook into it, you know, and, and God will do something in their lives. But I spent about, I know, it must have been 20 minutes with him and talking and sharing and praying with him, and he felt so revived, you know. So anyway, he left. But look at the timing of God. How can that be? Exactly, he was walking to his car. Probably two minutes later, he would have done backed out of, the, out of the yard and going down the road. See, that's God. And when, you're, when you have committed yourself, Lord, lead me to people, 
Remember God, the steps God of a righteous us. man are and ordered that's God of the Lord. in us. And I see that out. so much. I went, <clears throat> so much, so much. Uh, might have been two years ago when Francis was in the hospital. That's uh, Frank's uh, mother. And uh, we went down and visited her and uh, had prayer and everything and spent a little time with her. And then Frank and me and Susan walked out in the hallway, talked a little bit. And I'm saying all of that to show you the timing of God now. And so after about three or four minutes talking with uh, Frank, Susan and me went on down the hallway. We come to the elevator, and we're on the second floor, and uh, we hit the, the number. The door opens. We walk in. We go into the elevator. We're all by ourselves, and we hit the uh, thing. The door shuts, and we hit number one to go down, but it didn't move. Elevator didn't move. I said, my, Okay. So I hit it again. It still didn't move. So I said, well, I'll hit number two again. I hit number two, the door open, and this woman is standing there, and she says, do you know where I can find a pastor? I have somebody down here in one of these rooms that's ready to re receive Christ as her personal Savior. And I had my little badge on there showing that I was a pastor. I said, right here. And we went down there. I shared the gospel with this woman in bed. She received Christ as her personal Savior. See, that's how Jesus walked. Learn to walk like Jesus. We don't have to plan anything. Very few things does Susan me plan. It's all planned for us by God or other people. God moves through other people. It's all planned. Now, you take not this Friday, but Friday after next. I know where I'm going to be. Does anybody know where they're going to be? Well, I'm going to be right here at 7 o'clock watching this movie, Christian movie, that uh, Rick and Missy is going to have for all of us. See, it's already planned. Hello? <laughs> okay. That's a good way to make a, what would you call it, an announcement. Okay. All right, now, let me, I could go on and on. Now, let's, let's read on here now. Uh, look at, all right, we've said that, look at that. Now, let's read that again. Therefore, brothers, since we have full freedom and confidence to enter into the Holy of Holies by our good works, and because we're so good and we obey God in everything, huh? What? Did I miss that? What? Well, by the power and the virtue of the blood. The blood has not lost its power, saints. You can't get no cleaner than you are right now. Somebody said what? Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, I, I said you can't get no cleaner. Amen. You can't get no cleaner. Amen. Let me tell you, the blood's not lost its power. See, tell the devil to go back to hell where he belongs. The blood has sanctified you. The blood has cleansed you. You can't get no cleaner than you are right now. Oh, how we struggle with that. Don't we? Come on, love me now. Have we not struggled with that? And when God showed me that, I, I, I had to repent. Bob, don't you understand what my son did for, for you and the pe my people? All those thousands and thousands of animals that was killed in the Old Testament could not cleanse it from people. Only covered it until the one sacrifice in the fullness of time came and died on that old rugged cross. And now the sin principle, the sin problem has been dealt with. Receive. Our biggest problem as people of God, and I'm talking about myself, <coughs> is to receive what the Lord has done. You don't have to go to the altar and beg for forgiveness. Now, I know that goes against some of our traditional thinking. Just reach out by faith and receive what the Lord has done. God, you can't do anything to make God love you any more than he loves you right now. You don't have to jump through any hoops. You don't have to go to the altar and beat on the 
altar. You can if you want. It's a good exercise. I've done it a few times. You ever done it a few times? <laughs> Bob, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know, Lord. I just, listen, just receive what I've already done for you. See, once and for all, there's no, uh, there's no more <coughs> offerings or good works or I got to just, well, maybe if I string a little harder or something, probably get a Herndon and doing that. But it, yeah, we just receive. The Lord's done it already. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't have to join Joe Blow's church. Just receive what the Lord has done. Then unite with a good group of people and serve God because you love him, not for your salvation, because you're so thankful for what he's done. And now he's your heavenly father, and we're all brothers and sisters, and he wants his family together. Oh, hallelujah. I just had to jump up on that, okay? All right, let's go to that next um, verse 20. There we are. By this fresh, new, and living way, which we've been talking about coming to the throne now, which he initiated and dedicated and opened for us. Notice, he did it. Hello? Oh, can you see that? He's the initiator of our salvation. He's the one that dedicated it open for us through the separating of the curtain, veil of the Holy of Holies, that is through his flesh. What is he talking about? How many remember when he was crucified, the curtain was split. Nobody could get behind the curtain, only the high priest once a year to get into the presence of God. But he initiated it. Now, this, this is my thinking. All right. <clears throat> There's Willie. I'll use, I'm, can I pick on you? Okay. Willie is in this room all by himself. And he's saying, you know, the, once a year I have one person that comes in here that I'm able to fellowship just a little while. And he puts a little blood, animal blood on the, on, the, on the altar, on the mercy seat, and he goes, and that's all I ever see. My desire, now this is God. I'm speaking like, you know, I, I want to live in all my children. I want to fellowship with all my children. I got three girls. I want to fellowship with all three of them. Come on, church. I want to spend time with all three of them. I want to do things for all three of them. I love all three of them. I remember when they were born, they were just little kids, all wrinkled up, you know. Now all the wrinkles, those baby wrinkles go, and they got other wrinkles. They're in their 50s now. But I want to be with them. I want to see them. I want to eat, I want to eat with them. I want to go fishing with them. I want to fellowship with them. I want you to see it from God's viewpoint. He says, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to rip this curtain I think it's about 10 or, what is it, 12 inches, Frank, or 10 inches thick or something like that. I'm going to rip it from top to bottom. They'll know I'm the one that did it. He ripped it. Man didn't rip it. God ripped it. I'm getting out of here. Listen, not only can we come into the throne of God, but God has gotten out of the Holy of Holies, and now he's living in us. And he's made our bodies his temple, and now he's living in us and fellowshipping with us 24-7. Yes, but people need to become conscious of that. I know I can't sing, but I tell you, when I'm on my golf cart or I'm in the shower or I'm over there cutting grass, the lawnmower makes a lot of noise, so they don't know if it's the lawnmower doing that or me. But I'm singing and praising God. We're having fellowship. Him and me loves to cut the grass. When I get up, I say, Lord, you know, are we going to cut the grass today? Next thing you know, the telephone rings, like today. My oldest granddaughter called. Grandma, I hate to bother Grandpa. 
Oh, but he's the only one I got to help me out. Well, what do you want him to do? The line board won't crank. The line board won't crank. So Susan says, honey, Michelle just called. Her line board won't crank. I said, yeah, I, I know. I understand. <coughs> you see, if you leave it out in the rain, the water gets in the tank. <laughs> But see, old grandpa, seasoned by many battles, seasoned by many shocks of life. I said, well, as soon as we have our breakfast, and I have my second cu cup of coffee, <coughs> and we have uh, our breakfast and our communion and our prayer, then we'll get ready. We'll go over there. And so I went over there, and sure enough, it wouldn't crank. So I brought it home. I did everything I know to do, and it cranked just a little bit, and I knew what was wrong. It was water in the carburetor that means i got to take the carburetor off clean it all put it all back together but i didn't have time because i don't like to do those things on wednesday because i need to prepare my heart for the night so we went out to walmart we bought a brand new lawnmower we took it over there we cranked it up got it going for now cut your grass we come back home we had our lunch i went to bed took my nappy and got happy got back up spend some time with the lord come over here and here i am <clears throat> but see, it was the Lord and me doing it. And it's so simple. It's not complicated. Now, I remember the time you would have heard a big explosion over there at the Tilton's house. I mean, you understand what I'm talking about? See, see, when, see it's God working in me, meddling me down in the inside where I can be kind and gracious to people when they stick their tongue out at me or whatever they do, it don't bother me. I just say, brother, I just love you so much. Can I pray for you? I'm getting out of here. Right now. Well, hurry, don't go. go. Well, okay, love you. <laughs> See, you don't let the, those things get inside of you no more. Are, are, are you listening? I, I, I don't think some of you are listening. See, with the world situation, it could get into you. And that whirlwind, you know, all the, all the tornadoes out there in the West, you'll have a tornado going inside of you all the time. Is that not true? Huh? See, this is not working out. Not working. What difference does it matter a thousand years from now, a hundred years from now, five years from now? We don't, little things warp us up so badly. And God said, listen, I'm in you. Hold steady. Everything's all right. It's okay. It's okay. And Jesus comes up with something like this. Would you put uh, St. John 5 up there? St. John 5. Boy, this is powerful. Let's see if I can find it here. 5. <coughs> Lord, help me. Okay, St. John 5. No, it's 8. I'm sorry, 8. I, I'm, it's coming out of my, my mind right now. 851. Oh, I tell you, this is awesome. Look at that, 51. Are you ready for this one? I assure you, most Solomon, now Jesus is speaking. Now, always remember, when you read the Bible, find out who's speaking. And Jesus is speaking. He says, I tell you, if anyone observes my teaching, lives in accordance with my message, keeps my word, now there's the condition, he will by no means ever see and experience death. Now, that's new for some folks. You ain't going to see this salvation that God has procured for us. Oh, we will never see death. O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? What does that mean? That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Right, 8, I think it is. O grave, where is thy victory? 
You will never, you will, I'm sorry, I don't care how pretty you want. I know the, the, the caskets are so pretty today. They're so beautiful. They have the laces and, and they're so, ever, you, ever, you ever get in one and just lay back in one? Why are some of you looking at me strange? They're so comfortable. You will, you will never be in that casket. Now, your body will be. This old body, do you want to take this body to heaven with you? Man, God's got better plans than that. He's got a glorified body. An eternal body. See, we have eternal life. These things have been written that you might know. That you have eternal life right now. Right now. Right now. Have eternal life. You will never die. If you got eternal life, you'll never die. Say so your spirit is eternal. But your body, this old body, because of Satan, not, I'm sorry, because of Adam, this body cannot, this flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we put this flesh and blood in the casket, in the grave, but our spirit, Goes to be with the Lord. Absent from the body. What is absent from the body? Your spirit is present with the Lord. So death is a liberating factor in your life. I mean, who wants to live to be a hundred? Let's see. Missy wants to live to be a hundred. Do you want to live? I, I'm not going to scold you. Okay. <laughs> Here comes Missy and then Mrs. James. I mean, <laughs> Uh, time they get to the, time they get in the door, the service is over. They got to turn back around. <laughs> Man. Well, I got news for you. You're going to live more than a hundred. You're going to live throughout eternities, out of eternities, and you'll be in a glorified body. Now, I'm like Paul. If I'm, be, I'm between a fix. How many of you know what Paul said? As far as I'm concerned, I need to go. But for you folks, I want to stay around a little longer. Now, I want you to look at the next verse, 52. Look at the next verse. Now, say, I'll never experience death. Go ahead. Say it. There you go. Next verse, 52. i got to get on with this teaching. <laughs> My goodness, time goes by. Now, Jesus is, uh, uh, was speaking. Now, the Jews said to him, said to Jesus, now, we know that you are under the power of a demon. That wasn't very kind of them, was, was that? I mean, they, they're talking to their creator. You, you, you understand? Everything's been created by Jesus. Everything's held together by the word of his power. And they're looking at their, and speaking like that to their creator, you got a demon. That's what they're, they're accusing him of. Then they say, you're insane. Ooh. Abraham died, they said, and also the prophets. Yet you say, if a man keeps my word, he will never taste of death into all eternity? See, the secret was kept from them. They didn't know that one day God Almighty would live in every human being that has accepted him as their Lord and Savior. They were blind. This mystery of Christ in us was hidden from all of them. They didn't understand. They're Pharisees. They studied the Scriptures. But see, there's a veil over their minds, and they could not comprehend the things of God. But today, the Holy Spirit reveals, notice what it says, reveal to us is God living in us. I want you to turn our next Scripture to... Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.30. 1 Corinthians 1.30. Powerful scripture. Oh, I love this scripture. Now, we're going to let that be on the board for a while. And uh, it's 1.30. Well, not really. It's actually eight minutes after t eight. Okay. <clears throat> All right, you got your handouts? All right. 
this, I hope, and I've asked everybody to read this at home and study it because it means, it will mean a lot to you when the revelation hits you about what the truth is in these pages. This is one elementary subject that most Christians still don't fully understand. And it is the powerful key to spiritual breakthrough for countless believers around the globe today. Don't believe you're just an old forgiven sinner just because some pastor tells you so. Look, these things, look these things up in the word of God for yourself and know the truth. For Jesus said clearly that if we continue in his word, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. So if we're not sinners, what are we now? Saints, you will not show me one place in the Bible that the scriptures was written to sinners. It told us about sinners, but not to sinners. It was written to saints. It was written to saints. So remember that. All right, look at the next one. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's in John 8, 32. I'm going to read just a little bit now. The opposite of truth is deception or false belief and will cause you to live in bondage unnecessarily. This subject is no exception. If you see yourself as a failure, listen to me now, you will not be able to boldly exercise your authority in Christ because you will feel unworthy. Now, we have at times, and we have to admit, as we look back in our lives, we've felt so unworthy. But it doesn't have anything to do with our unworthiness or our worthiness. It's unmerited favor. It's because of God, what God has done. Notice this. But if you feel unworthy all the time, then you're going to act unworthy, and then you're going to act, your lifestyle is going to be accordingly. You got to know who you are in God, in Christ. I was watching uh, a little bit of the news the other day on TV, and this uh, one announcer, she's a very attractive uh, woman, heavy set but very beautiful face, and she was talking to this guy about them playing this ball, this volleyball. Anybody been keeping up with the volleyball thing? Nobody in here. You know. Volley, is that volleyball? Soccer. Well, yeah, that's about the same thing, in it? I mean, it's got a ball. You just one you, one you kick, the other one you hit. Okay. Anyway, the soccer ball. Okay. Now, I don't want to be ugly because I'm not there. Okay. I used to be there, you know, and I don't want to. But this guy was making her feel like she, would, she didn't care about people that are kicking that little ball, you know, and everybody. See everybody hollering? Did, did anybody watch this thing? All right. I, they had hundreds of people. <laughs> I mean, all, everybody, the kids, the dogs, the cats, every, what, <laughs> hollering about. The, the, are you out there, church? Anyway, I'm going to stay out of trouble tonight. <clears throat> and he was making her feel like that, trying to make her feel like that, but she wouldn't take it. She said, I know who I am. I know who I am. Do you know who you are? You are daughters and sons of the living God. It doesn't matter what people might say. You know who you are. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. God Almighty that spoke and things came into existence lives in you and me. See, we got to see that. The Bible makes it very clear. The power is not of this vessel, but it is of God. And the more you believe in that, the more that power is going to be manifested. And people don't understand that, and they keep confessing the negative. And if they would confess what the Lord has done, he will manifest himself. I am strong in the Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, as our minds are renewed, we'll be transformed. And until our minds are renewed in Christ, we will not be transformed. We will not walk in that place where God has planned for us to walk in power, in strength, in authority. I ain't fussing. Everybody say, Pastor Bob ain't fussing. But you understand, I'm trying to punctuate it. 
Now you get out there and show what you made of. <laughs> Amen. Say, you know who you are. But until you know who you are, the devil's going to ride shotgun over you. That's right. Make you think you're nobody. No, you are a child of the living. You are sons of God. Paul says, you're no more slaves. He had to get after the Galatians. You're no more slaves. You are sons of the living God. Right now, you have eternal life. Right now, you are a child of God. Right now, the Bible says that. Right now, not tomorrow. Not when you get your glorified body. Right now, where you're sitting, you are a son and a daughter of the living God. God lives in you. And that's what God kept secret all those years, hundreds of years, and has made known to us the mystery. Christ in our hearts, our only hope of glory. Christ in our heart, where we can do what he tells us to do. Because he'll do it in us and through us. Now, it takes time to grow up in that, but I'm planting the seed. All right, let's move on real quick. Like, If you claim to be unworthy, look at, the, look at that now. All right, let's move on up. No. All right, let's start with this. The opposite of truth is deception and false belief. Everybody follow me? The first page, the very first page. And will cause you to live in bondage unnecessarily. This subject is no exception. If you see yourself a failure, you will not be able to boldly exercise your authority in Christ because you will feel unworthy. And you know, our feelings have great uh, influence over us, doesn't it? And you have to learn to just live by the Word of God and not your feelings. Because I'm sure some of you wouldn't be here tonight if you was following your feelings. Now listen, you feel unworthy even after the blood of Christ has made you worthy. We have to understand that God made us worthy. And for us to say we're unworthy, what would we say on that, Willie? Yeah. We say, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe what you're saying. Wait a minute. Has the blood made you worthy? Raise your hand if that's be so. Okay. You hold that position. Because your mind is going to fight that. Now, we're not, you say, well, I'm, I'm going to get all puffed up. No, you won't. So, you won't puffed up. You, what do we have to praise God? Other than praise him for what he's done. <laughs> Uh, we'll get into that just a little bit. I got all right. Let's move on real quick. Like all right. Now, even after the blood uh, uh, of Christ has made you worthy, if you claim to be unworthy after the blood of Christ has made you worthy, then you are denying the work of Christ in your life. Ooh, boy! When I read that, I repented. You can repent. That's not a bad word. Just go ahead, all of you. Just repent. <laughs> I repent a lot. Every time I get in this word, I say, oh, God. All right, I want you to say to yourself, I am, I am worthy. Go ahead. Say to yourself, I am worthy. Because Jesus' blood has made me worthy. Because of Jesus' blood has made me worthy. Oh, I love it. You are loved by God the Father. Remember that. He can't love you no more than he loves you right now. You are loved by God, not because of what you've done, but because of what you are. The Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He longed to have a relationship with you even before you became his child. Now, I want us to see it from God's viewpoint. Now, to help you along your way, you might not know this, but when you get up in the morning, the first thing you do is think uh, uh, about the Lord. Okay? Everybody just say, I'm going to think about the Lord. And what I do is I say, good morning, Holy Spirit, or good morning, Father. And then I tell Susan, good morning, honey. And she says, good morning, honey. And then we take that hoodie and put it in our coffin, uh, coffee. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, that's what I use in my coffee is honey. How many use honey in their coffee? I do. Try it. Get all that sugar out of your system. So we put honey in my coffee. She don't drink coffee, by the way, but I drink one cup. 
All right, you are loved by God, not because of what you've done, but because of who you are. Now, when we do good, it does make us feel good, doesn't it? I like to do a good job, it does, but that's not, not why God loves you. Remember, he loved you while you wasn't doing good. You remember back when you were sinners? Every night at the honky-tonk, remember that? <laughs> Some of you don't know how to, you just don't know how to have. I, <laughs> I know some of these, anyway, we won't go that way. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, you are loved, loved. Reg even when you were doing the worst thing in the world, you were loved by God Almighty. You are loved by God, not because of what you've done, but because of what you are, who you are. The Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were doing all those ugly things, that's when he died for us. He longed to have a relationship with you even before you became a child. Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love towards us. When? When we were perfect? When we were doing everything right? No. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Boy, that's powerful. Have you ever done anything for somebody while they were still sinners? Think that through. You straighten up and I'll do something for you. That's not, how, that's not God's love. You'll do things for people while they are yet sinners. Some people can't understand that. And that's what God did for us while we were yet sinners. Now, I know there might be some people here have never went to the honky-tonk or did anything but they consider great sin, but see, you were born in sin. Do you realize that? You were born in sin. You inherited sin from Adam. Your DNA had sin in it. You might not have done nothing as far as man is concerned, uh, but you were a sinner because you inherited that nature from Adam, okay? Now, this one, <clears throat> this one may be hard to get your mind around, that it is, it is true. God loves us with the same love that he had towards Jesus himself. Look at this passage in the scriptures. Let's put that on the board, John 17, 23. And we didn't get to read that. We'll come back. We're going to come back to that one in just a minute. After this. Look at this. This is powerful. John 17, 23. I in them and, and you in me. In order that they may become one and perfectly united. That the world may know and definitely recognize that you sent me and that you have loved them even as you have loved me. Boy, that's powerful. God loves us as much as he loves Jesus Christ. Wow. I'm trying to think that if the Bible talks about his intense love, have you ever had some intense love for somebody? Intense love that burnt in your heart. Intense love. That's what God had for all of us. Intense love. He had to satisfy that intense love and do something for us. When you love people, you got to do something for them. Okay, and I know that's hard for us to understand. Powerful. Now let's go back to that other scripture um, in 1 Corinthians 1.30, and I want to finish up with this, and there's so much in this, and I hope you'll take this home, and please read it and study it. 
and bring it back next Wednesday night. We'll try to go through it a little bit more, okay? Now look at this next scripture. This is a tremendous scripture. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. But it is from him. Now who is him? Remember, it's a capital H. So it's God, okay? But it is from God that you have your life in Christ Jesus. So how did we get our life? He put us in Christ. And who put us in Christ? God. And it's because of him that we have our life in God. Nothing we have done whatsoever. Before, I believe it's before the foundation of the world. Remember I said Sunday when I had the cross here. We had to be in Christ when Christ was crucified because we were, the old man was crucified with Christ. How many remember I said that? So I personally, and if you find it anywhere in the Bible, do let me know that at a specific time, that, you know, but I think it was before the foundation of the world, that's when Christ was crucified, and I think that that's when we were put in, uh, in Christ. And, of course, when we accepted him as our Lord and Savior, that's when he came into us. So, but it is from God himself that you have your life in Christ Jesus. Whom God, that is, Christ made God our wisdom, or made Christ our wisdom. See, Christ is our wisdom. Christ is our life. Revealed to us a knowledge of the divine plan of salvation. God reveals to us his divine plan of salvation as we read his word. And many people receive it just by the Spirit of God. Because you remember, the first century church didn't have this Bible. They had the Old Testament. But they did not have this word until way later. It was years, hundreds of years before saints like you and me. I think it was maybe, what, 1500 when the printing press was invented. Some of you Bible history scholars can tell me at some point they begin to write it down and print it out. So in the, anyway, in the last, let's say, 500 years, we've been, the church has been blessed to have this word because all those hundreds of years after Christ passed and went on into heaven, this word, nobody had that word, Harley. Very few people had. They had Old Testament scriptures, but not the New Testament. And we have the New Testament. All right, now look at that. So God made Christ our wisdom. He's our wisdom. So when you, when you, when you want wisdom, you say, Lord, you're my wisdom. And where is he at? He's in you, and he will manifest his wisdom through you. Did you catch that? See, the wisdom is in Christ. Lord, you are my wisdom, and I thank you, Lord, that you are manifesting your wisdom through me. He has become our wisdom. So you really have, we all really have all wisdom, because all wisdom is in Christ. Christ is in us. Now, Lord, manifest your wisdom in this problem. Manifest your wisdom in this situation. Bring forth your wisdom in this situation, Lord. Okay? Reveal to us a knowledge of the divine plan of salvation previously, now notice this, hidden. Where did we read that before? Colossians 1.27. Remember, remember? It was hidden. Hidden. Manifesting itself as our righteousness. What is that wisdom? Christ is our wisdom. Look up there. Made our wisdom. So Christ is our wisdom. And it's manifesting itself as, he's manifesting himself as our righteousness. So he's imputed his righteousness to us. He lives in us. And it's his righteousness that we're engulfed in because we're engulfed in him. And he is our righteousness. Everybody see that? If you don't see it, raise your hand. If you see it, raise your hand. Good. 
Now, every day, you need to say that. Learn to acknowledge and say the Word of God. Now, look. Well, good it says. Previously, it was hidden back in the Old Testament. So everything we need is in Christ. Wisdom, strength, power. I can do all things through Christ. He is my wisdom. He is my righteousness. He is my redemption. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. He is my God. He is the, the great I am. He is the resurrection. He is eternal life. Everything is in Christ, and we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. Therefore, we all have it. All right? Thus making us upright. Now, who's making us upright? God, Christ himself, his righteousness, makes us upright and putting us, he puts us in right standing with God the Father. Because we've received him and he makes us and now we, can, we have right standing with God and we can come to the throne of God and spend time there with him and worship him and praise him. Walk each day with God. Have a great time in God. Look what it says. And our, he's our consecration, making us pure. He's the one that makes us pure and holy. And our, he's our redemption. Notice this. Providing our ransom. He provides our ransom, which we, we are bought back to God from eternal penalty for sin. Ooh, better catch that. Providing our ransom from eternal penalty. And what is the eternal penalty? Death and hell. All that's took care of by Jesus. God ain't holding anything against us because we've accepted him and he, Christ has become for us, everything we need to satisfy the Father. And we walk with Him each day. We have fellowship with Him every day. We love Him. We can do all things through Him. He lives in us. He has all wisdom. We can tap into His wisdom. He will direct us and guide us. And and many of us, you know, if you would write down all the experiences, I tap. I told Susan, I said, we need to write some of these ex experiences down. I mean, I, I remember a lot of them, but there's a lot we forget. I want to share this one thing more, and we're going to close. How many is going to read this all the way through this week? Give you a little homework. How many ain't going to do it? How many is going to do it? All right. Put your hand way up. I want to see it. I want to get the picture. Let me get my camera. Where's my camera at? <laughs> All right. I'm not going to ask you questions, but I, this is for your own sake. And then when, I, when we go back into it next week, you're going to understand it more. How many, did everybody understand what I was talking about tonight? That's the main thing, not to impress you on how well I can speak, but to, to break it down little by little where we can see it. Okay? All right.